imperfect people, human beings, your creation, to be the bearers of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You entrust it to us and you empower us with your precious Holy Spirit in order to minister the Word of God, the Word that is so powerful, the Word that brings life, the Word that is able to transform lives and take what is broken and bring joy and love and peace and all that you want. And so with this real sense of expectation, we come here tonight, believing because this is your Word and because you love us, and because you are with us, that you will speak to us. Amen. And so we invite you to speak. Quite Amen. Deliberately in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, Emily, are we right? We're set, ready to go? Emily doesn't do this very often, but she's been happy to jump in and, and have a go. So here we go. Our reading today, as we've heard, comes from Luke's Gospel. We don't always get a very clear understanding about the reason and even the authorship of some of the books of the Bible. We have to often infer that because, uh, and sometimes from some of the text itself, and often this causes some quite heated or at least robust discussion amongst theologians and teachers. But we don't have that problem when it comes to the Gospel of Luke. Because we know a whole lot about Luke. Luke was an, a, a companion of the Apostle Paul. And of course we know the Apostle Paul wrote just about half of the books in the New Testament. And Luke himself gives us a very <coughs> clear picture of the purpose that he writes the Gospel to us. And we're going to read this off the screen up here. So I'm going to read it out to you. You can follow if you're able to. I'm sorry, I'm just... I might have to pull these pages out because all I'm seeing is glaring on my, on my sheet. Let's, we'll get there. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Now I'm going to say something a little bit uh, about Luke, just to, um, to get a bit of a, a, a picture of where we're coming from here. Luke was a doctor. Luke was a, an historian. And so we can imagine with Luke, he's got a scientific mindset. And when Luke comes to write this for us, his gospel, he is after the facts. He's after the truth. And to the, get to the facts, Luke goes looking for eyewitnesses. He addresses his letter to somebody by the name of Theophilus. Now, we're not really sure what he's referring to here. Some people think it's an individual, it's a person. Some people um, think it, 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 is, it is more a general reference to a student or someone who is looking for the truth because that's what the name means. And back in that culture, names, as it is, I'm sure it is for many um, Middle Eastern cultures of you here, names have great meaning and that meaning is all wrapped up in the individual and in the person. And so, but regardless of whether it was an individual or a, a student that Luke is writing to, his purpose for writing was so that that person could be certain about what he believed. Luke wants the reader, and that means you and me, to be certain about what we, be we believe. And so, as far as Luke is concerned, only reliable witnesses, only eyewitnesses, only trustworthy witnesses are good enough for what he wants to say and what he wants to teach. I've even heard it suggested that Luke wrote his gospel as well as the book of Acts. He's the author of both of these two books. You've kind of got Luke, gospel of Luke part one and then part two in the book of Acts. 
And, and the suggestion is that this might even be a legal document. Um, a document that would have been necessary that, to accompany the Apostle Paul when he was to stand trial before Caesar in Rome. Because there had to be documents that preceded any such trial at that higher level. But whatever the reason, if Luke was standing here today instead of me, he would want to say to you, he would want to say to all of us, you can be confident in the reliability of what I am telling you. Because I only bring testimony from rock solid witnesses. So the story that was read for us this afternoon um, comes right near the beginning of the gospel, right at the start of Jesus' ministry. In fact, it's the passage immediately before today's reading that Luke has chosen to launch his description of the ministry of Jesus. Interestingly, I'm sorry, I'm still pulling this out because I can't see it. The lights are reflecting of it. It's interesting that Luke even indicates that the story he launches with, which I'll explain just briefly in a minute, isn't the first story that happens. But Luke has deliberately chosen it. He's indicated um, that Jesus has already been teaching. He's already been healing. He's already been getting a, a reputation throughout the towns of Judea. And yet Luke deliberately chose what took place in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth to begin his eyewitness testimony of the life and ministry of Jesus. And that story happened back there in Nazareth when Jesus took up the scroll in the synagogue of his hometown and he declared, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. His emphasis on the poor, on the prisoners, on the blind, and on the oppressed was a summary of the humble state of every individual to whom the kingdom of God comes. In other words, Jesus, when he stood there amongst his hometown, he is saying the kingdom of God can only come to those who recognize that they are in need. They recognise that they need the salvation that only Jesus can give. And so, of course, that declaration ruffled a few feathers of the self-satisfied Nazareth congregation, just as it continues to ruffle lots of feathers in our world today, particularly in our Western society that is so self-reliant, so self-built, so able to do it and to do it my way. But now, Jesus has moved to the town of Capernaum, and that's where the story takes up today. And here, in this town, things are very different. The response of the people is very different. Instead of being scandalised by Jesus' kingdom teaching, they were amazed. Because Jesus taught with authority, and his actions backed that up. And so now... Because of this amazement and this openness and this expectation, Jesus is able to go to work and do amazing things in this atmosphere. And we could do all sorts of talking tonight about what that means for us in terms of our own sense of expectation. But that's not where I'm, where I'm going. But we can learn so much out of that. What it means to come and to expect that Jesus is going to work amongst us. Amen. So now he's able to go to work in this atmosphere of acceptance, atmosphere of humility, atmosphere of expectation. And here in Capernaum, Jesus demonstrated his authority and his power as emphasized by how he delivered this poor man from an evil spirit in the story today. There is that strong lesson for us that comes out of the contrast about what Jesus was able to do in Capernaum compared to what he was not able to do in Nazareth. Especially for those of us that might have grown up in a church atmosphere. I know there's many people here who have only been believers for a short period of time. And in some respects, I envy you. 
Because there is still that sense of wonder and expectation. But I grew up in church. You know, uh, church has been a part of my life, all of my life, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm very, I'm not, you know, despising that in any way. But it, it, it's easy for it, me just to become used to it, and uh, um, and, and just expect certain things to be happening all the time. And we expect um, God just to do things the same way that He has always done. We think, or we contend to think, that we know enough about church. We know enough about what it means to be a Christian. We know enough about God and to expect what He is going to do next, rather than wait and to allow and to expect that God might do something new, something special. See, just like the people in Nazareth, they thought they knew about Jesus. They thought, Jesus, he's the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph. But now Jesus comes and he's the master, the one who teaches with authority, the one who speaks as Lord and King. That's just not how we know him. And certainly not the loss of control out over our own lives and our own destiny that we want. And so they held Jesus at arm's length. In fact, they decided to put away with him and take him out. So in the Gospel of Luke, Luke explains to us that it's here in Capernaum that the mighty kingdom power of Jesus showed itself and then began to, um, to, to travel throughout the nation. And that's where our story um, really kicks off this, this afternoon. Following the healing in the synagogue, Jesus and those who were with him then go back to Simon's house. We know Simon as Simon Peter, the fisherman. Okay, uh, But here, um, his name is still Simon. Jesus hasn't given him that other name, the name change yet. And when he gets there, he discovers that Simon, who is clearly married because he's got a mother-in-law, and, but his mother-in-law in the house is gripped with a fever. Now, there's no suggestion that she is dying, but we all know what it feels, that it feels like we're dying when we're in that sort of fevered state, especially us men, right? <laughs> Even the simplest of tasks feel like we're trying to climb Mount Everest when we have the flu. Well, Simon's mother-in-law really was sick. And so Jesus is naturally asked to help her. And there we read in verse 39. And Jesus stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. You know what I find really interesting here? is that the word that, Luke's, that Luke uses for rebuked is the same word... Whoa! <laughs> Must be not. Was it off, was it? Oh my goodness. Can you turn it down before I have to hold it? I can put it back in the mud thing and I can just walk around now. <laughs> Obviously I've got a loud enough voice without a microphone. That's, that's clear out of this. Okay, the same word that Jesus uses here for rebuked over the fever is the same word that Jesus used when he commanded or rebuked the demon and told him to come out of the man in the synagogue. And the effect is exactly the same. Just as there was an immediate change upon this demonically possessed man, who one minute was in bondage to a demon and the next was completely free, the same effect was demonstrated by Simon's mother-in-law. One minute she is gripped by a fever. Unable even to get herself out of bed. But following Jesus' rebuke, the fever is gone. No after effects, no recovery time. All of this demonstrated by the fact that she immediately gets up and begins to serve them. I don't know about you, after I've been sick for a couple of days with a fever and the fever finally breaks, I'm good for nothing still until I can get a bit of sleep and get my energy and get some food into me. But that's not the case here. She's immediately able to get up and to begin to serve. And we're going to learn something. The healing is instant. The healing is complete. And it enabled her to serve those who were there in the house. And this is an interesting illustration, one that I've already begun to sense at work in the church here. And I want to commend you for that and encourage you. Because this kind of illustration has rightly been used to demonstrate more accurately what it means to be a Christian. 
to be a believer. That is, if you are in Christ, if you're a believer, if you've been delivered from death so that you've been delivered from the power that sin holds over you, the, the power of uh, the hold of sin over you, and sin's eternal consequences for your life, whether this has been a process of conversion that has gone on over a number of years or whether it's happened more recently and more immediately, nevertheless, when God declares us to be delivered from the hold of sin over our life through faith in Jesus' death on the cross as a punishment for our sin and his resurrection, then that deliverance is instantaneous and it is complete. It is done. Now, there will still be effects of sin on our life. There is still the susceptibility for us to stumble, for sure. But there is no longer any penalty for our sin. When we are born again, we are justified, we are set free from that bondage, and the freedom in God is complete. But in this powerful little story, this woman is also delivered not just to be free from the, from the fever and the effect that that fever has. She is delivered for a purpose. Because immediately upon that deliverance, she begins to serve. And here's the illustration for us today. If you are a believer in Jesus, how are you serving in his church? And I, that's why I say I already sense by the different people involved and different activities that are happening that you understand that. That we don't get delivered and become a believer and baptized and then we sit down and you know take it all in from there on in. The moment we come into the body of Christ, we are delivered to serve one another. If you're a believer in Jesus, how are you serving him? How are you serving his church? Throughout the Bible, and particularly in the book of Ephesians, the Holy Spirit makes it very clear that as believers, we are gifted. That is, that God has empowered us and gifted us um, in, in, um, has, and given those gifts to the people in the church. That's why I'm up here preaching, not the Holy Spirit. Because God has given a gift and He expects me to use it, whether I like it or not. And I'm doing that in order to fulfill his purposes, not mine. And when we are here within the church, we understand that God gives to our church everything he needs to fulfill his will and his purpose for our church. When something more is needed for this church, then he is going to give it. He's either going to gift it to one of those that are here, or he's going to bring somebody in. Uh, and to equip us to do the things that God has called us to do. But conversely, if we expand that out a little bit, if a church isn't achieving everything that God has called it to achieve, it's because either we are not called in the area, in the, 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 where, um, the, the things that he is calling, in fact we're not listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, and we need to go back and understand that and to, to move in that direction. Um, or else we are not using the gifts that God has given us fully in the church. Each one of us have been delivered from darkness, delivered from death, delivered from the hands of the enemy in order to serve. And so my question to you tonight is, are you doing that? Are you doing that? And if not, I'd love to encourage you to prayerfully consider that. I want to move on and say one more thing before we finish tonight. The next uh, part of the, the, the passage um, that, uh, that was read to us this evening, I was going to say that Paul read to us this evening, but there was two and I can't remember the other name. So, um, yeah, so. Uh, the, the, next, the next part is to me one of the most wonderful scenes in all of the Gospels. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty high call because there are some amazing scenes in, in the Bible and, and in the Gospels. But this, for me, is one of the greatest pictures because I'd like to suggest to you that I believe this is very much a picture of our future. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, then this is a picture of your future. 
Let me explain to you why I think, why I think that. But we want to read it again as we do that, starting from verse 14. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of men, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. I want you to try and imagine, close your eyes if you like, to try and think about what this experience would be like. If we were there on the streets of Capernaum on that evening, word of the miracle in the synagogue, and Jesus' location had quickly spread throughout the city. And crowds of people with every kind of disease and disability or demonic torment, with all their friends and their family, and they all gathered out in the street on what I like to imagine as a balmy summer evening. No, I don't find that in the text, but it adds to my picture, I suppose. And Jesus healed each and every one of them. Can you imagine it? This was wholesale healing. This was purposely indiscriminate. This was throw the wheelchair away, you're running home, you know? <laughs> but I want to say to you also, it wasn't in any way impersonal. Luke makes it very clear that not only did Jesus heal everyone, but ahead of that, he laid his hands on everyone. Now sure, this was an unrestrained display of raw kingdom power, and as, as such, the night would have been vibrating with healing and wholeness and joy and wonder and celebration and worship and all the things that would have accompanied that. But just as much as we are to see it as abundant and overflowing, we also are to see that it was personally and lovingly administered by Jesus' own tender hands. And here is a picture that should be burned into our brains. From today until we experience it for all of eternity. We know that God is just. We know that God is holy. We know that God hates sin. We know that God took the punishment for our sins upon himself and he calls each and every one of us to turn to him in humility and faith and receive forgiveness and be born again. But here, if we can only allow this scene to linger in our thoughts and minds, if we can allow it to stay with us, if we can get lost in the joy and the wonder and the celebration and the worship of this amazing evening, and if we can gaze ourselves into the eyes of the Son of God who lovingly and abundantly bestowed the healing power of God upon those who recognized their need and asked for healing. If we can understand that, then I believe we are coming very, very close to understanding what it is to look forward to that day, to long for that day when the trumpet sounds, when the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive with them join them in the air and gaze lovingly into the eyes of our Lord and Saviour. And our fears are gone. And our ailments are gone. And our bodies are whole and perfect. And our worries and our cares are but a distant memory. Because the promise has come. And we are with our Lord forever. In meditating on this image, can we then get a glimpse of how much more lovingly and joyously God looked upon each of you, each and every one of you, when you said to him, Father, I am a sinner. I am deserving and destined for death and I can do nothing about it. Will you heal me? Will you forgive me? Will you give me life? 
And now can you picture the look on our Saviour's face as he looks lovingly at you and says, Of course I can. Nothing could give me greater pleasure. You are now my child. Enter into your inheritance. And if you have never received the gift of eternal life that God offers, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then I want to say to you that this is a picture of God's loving heart towards you. Will you receive me? Will you let me take that burden? Will you let me forgive you? Will you be my son, my daughter, my beloved? And can we also recognise that we will never know the fullness of life that Jesus has promised to us until we realise and put into practice that we have been delivered to serve. We will only find true meaning and fulfilment when we are doing what Simon Peter's mother-in-law discovered, that we have been healed, we have been delivered to serve our Lord and to serve one another. We're going to come to a time now where we are going to share around the Lord's table and in different places we do that differently, so please bear with me, but I've noticed you're gracious and forgiving, so if I get things a bit out of order in the way that John and the rest of you do here, then you'll forgive me with that. But these two images that we have spoken about together tonight are very much at the heart of communion. John records for us in his Gospel, when he had... Jesus washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place. He said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. One of the commands that our Lord gives to us is to serve one another. So whenever we share around the Lord's table, we should remind ourselves that true fellowship, that true communion involves service. It involves serving our Father in heaven. It involves serving one another. So as we prepare to share the bread and the cup in just a few moments, let's reflect personally. God, how am I serving you? How am I serving this church to whom you have called me to belong? And let us commit ourselves to continue to serve. And the other aspect that we have spoken about is the love of God as he pours out his blessing on us. You know, there is no greater blessing that anybody can give than to be adopted into the family of God. There is no greater blessing than that. And you know, the ultimate symbol of being of becoming a part of the family is being invited to eat at the table. If you know some of the Old Testament stories, you may remember about the special bond that existed between David, who would become king in the Old Testament. And Jonathan, who was the son of the current king, King Saul, who was out to kill David because David was a threat. But David and Jonathan loved one another like brothers. And so when eventually David does become king and Saul is dead and, and sadly Jonathan is, has died, David goes looking for a way that he can show or express that kindness towards the descendants of Jonathan. And so he goes, is there any descendant left? And he discovers that one of Jonathan's sons, a man by the name of Mephibosheth, is there. And so he says to this, this man who comes, he's a cripple. And he welcomes him to the house. And I can imagine Mephibosheth is, is shaking.